We're going to turn now to the dangerous drought at Lake Mead. It provides 40 million Americans with water, and now it's at the lowest level since it was created in the 1930s. Well, as water levels continue to decline at Lake Mead, the question remains, how will we get water right here to Valley Resident? Lake Mead's water level has been dropping for more than three decades. A record-breaking drought is affecting Lake Mead. The river and its reservoirs are in danger due to the ongoing drought. The water supply is running out seriously impacting the local economy. Why is Lake Mead drying up? Stay tuned to learn why Lake Mead is drying up and what this can imply for the millions of people and dozens of states who rely on it. Lake Mead, the biggest lake in the United States, was built by the Hoover Dam on the Colorado River and spanned Nevada and Arizona supplying energy to hundreds of thousands of residents. It has been getting closer and closer to the dead pool level because of the present drought in the western United States. The lake's water levels were at their lowest this summer, 1,040.71 feet, dating back to the early 1930s. With a total production of around 2,080 megawatts and a water supply for over 25 million people, Lake Mead is a significant reservoir for the Hoover Dam's power generation. The water from Lake Mead serves purposes more than only feeding cities. More importantly, 60% of the food cultivated in the United States is irrigated using 70% of the reservoir's water supply. The United States economy's southwest region largely depends on Lake Mead. The primary source of the water for Lake Mead is the Colorado River system, which may be seen by examining Lake Mead. This is significant since the Colorado River is a cornerstone for the economics and welfare of numerous nearby states. The water supply for 40 million people comes in from this river, and Lake Mead is essential to this effort. The Colorado River system produces electricity in many dams, including the Hoover Dam at Lake Mead and the Glen Canyon Dam at Lake Powell. It provides water to the states of Utah, Arizona, Nevada, California and Mexico. One of the critical elements affecting the water levels in Lake Mead is the quality of precipitation. Due to the winter snowfall that flows from the Rocky Mountains down to the valley, it fluctuates periodically. However, it is becoming more challenging to anticipate seasonal weather patterns due to climate change. Consequently, Despite a recent rise in water levels, the lake is only 27% filled. The Colorado River watershed's shoddy design from nearly a century ago may also be contributing to the lake's decline. California, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, Colorado and New Mexico agreed to a treaty in 1922 to control the river's water flow. They based their conclusion on flow gauge data collected since 1890, which showed an average yearly flow of 17 million acre-feet. However, the Colorado watershed was experiencing a rainy period at the time. 13 million acre-feet were the more precise estimate for the 20th century. California and Arizona are the two states that utilize Lake Mead the most, with California reportedly drawing from the lake nearly three times as much as Arizona, despite both governments' attempts to use less water to protect the lake. Congress also approved a treaty in 1944 which promised Mexico 1.5 million acre-feet of Colorado River water. Since the river flowed seemingly endlessly, no one was using more water than they should have, and everyone had a comfortable buffer in case of drought. Everything was fine throughout most of the early 20th century. However, new proposals to utilize the river's water to only a tenth of its estimated capacity were put out by the 1956 Colorado River Storage Project. Like its twin, the 1957 Interstate Highway Project, the idea was anticipated to create a massive amount of new infrastructure and promote the settlement of America's West. A more extensive version of California's Los Angeles Basin development would see the reclamation of arid land for agriculture and urbanization via the building of additional dams, reservoirs, canals and power lines. One significant problem was that the design included an excessive flow number. The mistaken belief that they delivered 16.5 million acre-feet of water yearly persisted for the next 24 years, despite accumulating evidence. After that, the 1990s served as a wake-up call for the region, 
water planners had to investigate several catastrophic droughts throughout the years, before making new findings regarding carbon-14 and tree ring research. All living creatures absorb carbon-14, which they generally cease doing when they die, and so nitrogen-14 is created as a consequence of the radioactive decay of carbon-14. As a result, if we know how much carbon-14 a dead creature absorbs while living, we may test how much carbon-14 remains in dead organic matter to calculate how long it has been finished. Paleontologists had to examine ancient temperatures extending back more than 15,000 years to confirm the accuracy of their carbon-14 dating. This entailed properly recording changes in temperature and moisture to determine how rapidly plants grow. There was no hint in the geologic record, but the growth rings of a little tree known as the bristlecone pine were a critical early signal. This stubborn Ice Age remnant may persist for over 3,000 years and is only found in isolated places of the southwest. Pine tree wood generates hundreds of yearly growth rings thicker in dry cold and thinner in warm wet years. In a brilliant bit of detective work, researchers matched the thin and thick ring patterns in these pines to those discovered in wood from other known aged trees throughout America, some of which were long dead. They subsequently expanded their research to include even older semi-fossilized wood, lake bottom sediments and other markers. They also constructed computer models that mimicked the factors controlling the wood formation and adjusted them until they matched the paleontological record as they went along. By the 1990s, these systems could correctly estimate growth conditions for every location in the American West during the preceding 15,000 years and even forecast future needs. While doing so, it was observed that the Colorado watershed endured extensive cycles of wet to dry weather. Nothing as systematic as a calendar, but an 800-year cycle of drought, moisture and dryness again. The wet side of the cycle had reached its height in 1922, after which it naturally began to fall. In 2022, the watershed was well into a long-term drying cycle that had yet to hit its lowest point. Things might have been alright for longer if consumption hadn't skyrocketed from the 1950s through to the 1980s. Lake Mead would be virtually complete. Therefore, conservation measures would be minimal. Although the population boom was a sensible reason for increasing crops and irrigation, squandering all that water and all that land outraged 1950s sensibilities. The main issue was that much of the irrigated land was more suitable for producing crops like maize, wheat or potatoes. One could create them, but the cost of manufacturing and transporting would be more than their market worth. Consequently, the tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers and spinach were truck crops that were paid to grow there. The US government aided in stifling competition to establish a market for veggies from the Colorado watershed, although they had already flourished elsewhere. It may seem harsh to use the term crush, still. Grocery chains moved to Arizona suppliers with government support and established agricultural companies whose California crops had yet to be displaced, discovered their most significant consumers worldwide. To achieve its legislative requirement, the Colorado River Storage Project needed to show a benefit, which it did, at least temporarily. The quantity of water utilized, primarily to support unnecessary crops, could have been more sustainable. The farms generated less employment than local growers would have, had Arizona not forced them off the market. Despite this, there is less hunger now than in 1950, when there were 2.5 billion people to feed due to global food production that has maintained up. However, Nevada, not Arizona or California, would bear the brunt of the catastrophe. Las Vegas, a sweltering and dry city purposely constructed without substantial water resources, was a concern. On the surface, it may seem impossible that Las Vegas will run out of water from Lake Mead, since, absent a significant Rocky Mountain drought lasting more than a few years, the Colorado River will continue to flow. However, it is likely that by 2036, the cost of water will climb to prohibitive levels, that a significant section of Las Vegas's population will be forced to migrate. Businesses in the city and nearby regions will begin to limit operations even before then, as the expense of water will harm their bottom lines. 
Consequently, fewer tourists will visit Las Vegas, and a departure from the city will begin. Even before that occurs, Las Vegas may be forced to cancel or postpone several infrastructure and development projects after understanding that they may be for nothing. In other words, even if we take the scenario to its conclusion and Lake Mead does dry up, Las Vegas will have shrunk so much before that moment that its water scarcity would be a minor concern. Of course, to prepare for or alleviate the impacts of Lake Mead someday drying up, Las Vegas has been quietly attempting to acquire water rights from ranches and other sources hundreds of miles away to eventually import water through a massive pipeline. This has produced problems with other governments, notably Lincoln County. No one wants to give up their limited aquifers for Las Vegas or any other metropolis. Las Vegas has also been building on a new water intake from Lake Mead that is 135 feet deeper to acquire water from the dwindling reservoir. According to various sources, the most frequently asked question is whether the lake can be artificially filled. Experts have weighed in, stating that while it isn't technically impossible, the human resources and economic costs to undertake such a project would be astronomical, making it impossible to carry out. Others contend that if Lake Mead is to operate as a lake, the first step in restoration would be to close the truck farms and replace them with natural vegetation as quickly as possible. However, doing so would need political will, which Arizona lacks due to sustained lobbying by existing water consumers and land developers. The government still needs to make clear plans in the present political climate. If nothing changes, the numbers show that Lake Mead will virtually be gone by 2030, with Vegas fading into obscurity. Lake Mead will continue to dry for the foreseeable future, with its water level constantly dropping. Many more things are expected to be discovered when this occurs. Do you believe there is still time to save the situation? Let us know in the comments below.